ready, aim, fire. You, you come to a place like this, you train, you study, you work very hard, uh, you make an ambitious goal, something, a grand challenge, um, you aim for the goal, and if all goes well, you hit it. So that's what we do. Uh, here are some targets my lab hit. So one was the first faster than classical quantum computation, starting quantum computing as an experimental practice. One was we were part of creating the minimal synthetic organism, creating life from scratch. Um, one was the world's highest modulus ultralight material for um, super efficient structures. One was the birth of the Internet of Things. Uh, one was the leading safety sensor to protect uh, infants in cars from airbags. Um, one with a beloved Mel King, who I'll tell you more about, started a network of 2,500 fab labs um, in 125 countries, expanding access in underserved communities. So all of those were targets that my lab hit. However, none of them happened that way. Um, all of them weren't ready, aim, fire. They were ready, fire, aim. Uh, every one of them came from completely missing targets. Um, and so what I want to talk about is the difference between ready, aim, fire, which is how research is taught and funded, and the reality of ready, fire, aim. And I want to take you a tour of how each of these happened to then look ahead to how more people might have the opportunity to fail. So I teach uh, what's called how to make almost anything, um, but you could think of the class as how to fail at almost anything. And when John asked me, what's my superpower? What made all of those projects possible? I really realized I'm really good at making mistakes. So my, my superpower is failure. So let me take you on a tour of what that means. Uh, upper left was, we had, a vis we had an idea that we were going to make a fluidic ribosome. Ribosomes create you. They're the assembler that makes you. Why can't we make a ribosome that makes um, all of an anything for anyone? So create biology for non-biological systems. That was the idea. Turns out to be a terrible idea. It was completely doomed. We tried to make it. It never worked. There were stupid bubbles in the fluidics that blocked all these little particles, and it never, ever worked. Until one day, Manu said, well, let's make the bubbles the project. So um, we invented microfluidic bubble logic. To the, these bug bubbles, we realized, could compute. And then we realized you could use that to do genome transplantation to get a genome to create uh, synthetic organisms. So that came from the failure of trying to make a fluidic ribosome. Uh, the next one, we were doing a really short-term project with companies. This was at the birth of what became RFID to make tags that let, would let you read materials, to read objects. And you couldn't read more than one at a time. And so we had an idea, well, could you have nonlinearity in the materials so you could talk to one material? So I went for a hunt on nonlinearity in materials and thought, well, what about spin resonance, where two spins talk to each other? And we would make that into tags. And so we started doing that. And I didn't realize that the numbers were hopeless. It had no chance of working. There's no way you could get the signals. But we then realized this doomed project was doing a quantum computation. And so the nuclear spin coherence and spin-spin exchange let us do the first faster than classical quantum computations and worked out the Hamiltonian engineering techniques that have been used since. And in fact, also led to the, the, the quantum computers led to the reference platforms for RFID. So here, here's a third one. Uh, we were approached by the aerospace industry with the problem of how do you glue big composite parts together? And they wanted better glues to stick them together. So they gave us that problem. And we don't know much about glue, and we completely failed. We didn't, couldn't find any way to glue these parts together. And we were stuck, uh, unable to glue the parts together. And so we decided, well, why don't we give up and have no glue, and instead just snap little parts together? And so, um, in fact, earlier you saw a beautiful picture in architected materials. We were able to show that by an order of magnitude, we created the world's highest modulus ultralight material by without glue sticking together little loops of carbon fiber. And in the bottom corner, I'm showing with NASA we made, this is Langley's biggest wind tunnel, a super efficient morphing aero structure that's much more fuel efficient because the whole structure is deformable. Uh, this was a funny one. With uh, Todd Macover, I helped develop a cello for Yo-Yo Ma. And he's very unsentimental about the Stradivarius. It's just a, a conversion device. And he was interested. He knew the sonic palette, but he wanted a broader sonic palette. 
So I brought all a bunch of skills from the lab and instrumented the cello, and unfortunately, his hand kept getting in the way. We kept getting artifacts from his hand in the fields we were using to sense, and I had to do a contortion to try to get around that until I realized, and it actually in a very funny way went through my first student thesis doing tomography with hands, and then with Todd and Joe Paradiso and Penn and & Teller and Magic Trick in Las Vegas. And then the auto industry came running in and said, uh, airbags were killing infants in rear-facing child seats. Could we turn the cello turn magic trick into an auto safety sensor? And it became a $100 million a year business uh, protecting you in the car, all from we Yo-Yo's hand getting in the way. Um, uh, th this one was, I, I had an idea to connect the di digital and physical world for all the reasons to do that, of taking the principles of the internet into device physics. So the internet, a core concept is in t um, an end-to-end -end principle of internetworking, and I thought, let's do internetworking in the physics, and so I'm gonna have a signaling in the physics level to internetwork. So that was my great idea. It turns out it was a, just a terrible idea. The, the numbers don't work. It was very noisy. It, was, it wasn't robust at all. It, it didn't survive um, out in the wild, but through that, I got to know the founders of the internet, um, and this is a paper with no longer living but beloved Danny Cohen, um, and then this was an event with all the rest of them, and they said, my project was really stupid, but the way we were implementing the internet was really interesting, and so get rid of the dumb project. And this is one of the first things written about the concept of what became um, the internet of things. And this one was, there was a project with MIT and India's government at a high level on both sides to create a big lab in India that was a disaster. It, the project just failed, both sides were very unhappy, a lot of effort, um, uh, but through the kind of train wreck of that project, I got to know this saintly man, Kalbag, in rural India. Um, he ran research for Hindustan Lever, came to a, a Hindu life stage to give back. He went to the poorest, driest part of India to make a school for dropouts to learn technology. And he was the one who kind of grabbed me by the lapels and said, they don't need MIT's technology, they need the means to create technology locally to solve local problems. And so that thought let, led me to do a small lab with him. And from there, uh, Bill Mitchell introduced uh, Mel King, grand old man of community activism, deep connection at MIT, re recently passed away. By the seat of his pants, he invented modern mixed-use urban development um, in Tent City. And then Mel pioneered bringing uh, um, video into uh, his community when it wasn't telling stories of his community, then computing, uh, then the internet. And so it was a natural step to go from having technology in South End Technology Center to creating technology in South End Technology Center. So with Mel, we did the first fab lab that came out of the kind of train wreck of this project in India, and now there's 2,500 of those in 125 countries. They're doubling every year and a half. You know, it might be the biggest international program to come out of MIT that really came out of the failure of this project and running into Kalbag. So, stepping back, I hope you get a sense from those examples. Each is completely different, but they're sort of all the same. They all involve the same sort of sequence. Um, I'd say this is the second most important thing written from MIT. The most important thing I'd say written from MIT is Claude Shannon's master's thesis, the best thesis ever. I recommend reading it. But uh, Vannevar Bush, after World War II, when science won the war, was tasked to write what became this report, The Endless Frontier. This created the post-war research establishment, invented the National Science Foundation. The notion of national bodies funding science in the modern era came from that report. It's just enormously influential, but I'd say it had a fundamental mistake that we've been struggling with ever since. He enshrined the notion of basic research leads to applied research, leads to applications. And that's embodied in technical readiness levels where uh, projects go from the bottom to the top of that. And it should be clear now from all the examples I gave you, every one of those projects went exactly backwards. It went upstream. We started from a very sort of straightforward practical thing we were tripping over, and the practical thing turned into the basic research. So we're left with today to do science, to learn about it, to practice it. You're taught about milestones and deliverables. Milestones only make sense if you're going down a road and you want to know how far you are down the road. 
ready, aim, fire only hits what you aim at. To have surprise, you need to miss. And so we're doing random walks. We're doing biased random walks. And so fail fast is a familiar concept. But what's often missed is ready. You don't just get to fail. Ready is you have to do your homework. Fire, then you sort of close your eyes and sort of do anything in any direction. And you don't think much about what you're going to do. Then the key part is aim after you fire and you figure out what you did do. And in every one of those projects, there was a lot of homework. There wasn't much thought to what we're going to do. And then there was a lot of thought to what we did do. So I've had the freedom, the opportunity to, to fail often and not have repercussions. One of my hopes and goals is to, for all the grand problems we need to solve for the world, to give more people more opportunity to fail more often. And so with that, there's background here. Thank you.